feel like the file might be big. Right now. <coughs> okay, well, if it is, we'll. Oh, we're going, we're going to the adult reader. So today we're going to go over topics such as demographics, uh, economy, currency, balance of trade, cultural issues, physical forces, legal issues, political issues, and trade barriers. So last year, uh, the United States had a population reach, uh, nearing 314 million, which is the third largest in the world, um, coming in after China and India. Uh, and this is about nine times greater than Canada's population. Uh, the age demographics, um, the distribution is pretty similar to Canada's, with the majority of the population between 25 and 50 years, 54 years of age, and it is an aging population, so this will put an increased strain on the healthcare system and um, income benefits in the future. Uh, the life expectancy at birth is 78 years old, and this is just three years under uh, Canada's, with women expected to live five years um, longer than men. Um, the average household size is around 2.5, is 2.59, with a household income of $50,000. Um, both of these are um, under Canada, which has a average household income of three and, um, or average household side of three and an income of around 69,000. Um, this chart shows the um, uh, price of housing in the American market. Um, as you can see, obviously there was a huge drop in around 2008 because of the economy and now it's pretty volatile, having peaks and um, going under uh, the past two years or so. Um, the labor force is just under 50% of the total population at 155 million. Um, it, there's an 8.2% um, unemployment rate and uh, the minimum wage is 725. The unemployment rate is just above Canada's and the uh, minimum wage is just below Canada's. Um, this could be because there is like a, a way bigger population so there is a surplus in workers. Uh, the skill level is pretty similar to Canada with 10% of the total being uh, having primary education, 30, 29% secondary, and 31 tertiary, where Canada has a uh, much greater tertiary education of around 46%. Um, currently, the United States is in a trade deficit with imports coming in around 2.4 trillion and uh, exports around 1.6, um, compared to Canada, which is in a slight surplus, so. Um, the GDP per capita is around 50,000, which is around 10,000, or uh, 10,000 more than Canada, and they're both growing around the same rate of the United States at 2.2% and Canada around 1.9%. Uh, on the Gini index, the United States is ranked uh, 41st with a score of 45. It is a lot higher than Canada with a score of 32. Um, for the currency, we decided just to show uh, the US dollar in relation to the euro and the Canadian dollar. Um, since June 2011, there has just been a gradual appreciation against the US dollar. And now I'm going to hand it off to Chris for the listing. Thanks, Lauren. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about some of the cultural issues that the US is facing, and as Lauren said, I'll begin with religion. <coughs> so 51% of the population is Protestant and 24% is Roman Catholic. What this means is that 75% of the population is Christian. Uh, the other 25% of the population is either undeclared or part of some other religion. 71.6% um, of Americans uh, vers uh, think religion is very important versus 59.1% of Canadians. So what this means is that religion is huge in the U.S. And although they say that religion and politics are separated, it does have a weight in politics um, as well. Um, the thing to note on this slide is that 25% of the population, even though the 25% who is not Christian, um, that segment of the population is growing. So this is a huge challenge for employers who are now having to adjust their policies um, to cater to these different religions. So 
They might have to give extra break time um, or perhaps alter their dress code so that people can wear certain garments. In terms of the treatment of women, the U.S. has largely been uh, a leader in addressing the challenges that women face in the workplace. So all the way back from the Civil Rights Act in 1964 when sexual harassment was addressed, the Family Medical Leave Act, uh, which ensures that women will have pay during the time that they take off for pregnancy, and most recently the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, which was enacted by Obama, which is an effort to uh, close the gap on the, tr uh, the uh, pay differences between men and women. So although there is still inequalities between men and women, there is work being done to further close that gap. Now I'm gonna talk a bit about the business customs in the US. Uh, the first phrase on there I have is, have a nice day. And this is because Americans are very overtly friendly people, and especially in business as well. It's just part of the way that they do business. And this can't be taken as, um, you can't take this as Americans wanting to be uh, having a long-term relationship with you. It's just part of the way that they do business. The second phrase I have is, what do you make? And this is to represent that Americans will ask you private questions. Um, they're very open about asking those sorts of things, and they're very open to debating things. And again, that's part of the way that they do business, so you shouldn't be offended, because to them, that's nothing malicious, it's just how things are done, and it's part of the efficiency. And you can see these two things really contrast with each other, so you might go into a meeting, and the American seems very friendly, and then you might be kind of shocked when they ask you a personal question or something like that, but it's nothing to be offended by. Um, up here, I have a bunch of different jargon. Uh, this is basically to represent that Americans are very keen on using the latest, the latest management speak. So they're very heavy on the jargon, and if you're doing business in the US, you need to make sure that you know the jargon of the industry that you're working in so that you can follow the conversations. Up here, I have uh, an organizational structure. And you might be surprised because it says executive vice president at the bottom of the structure. This is kind of just a dramatization to show that uh, the job titles in the US can be very confusing. Um, and they're not very representative of the true relative importance of a person's job. So if you want to look for the relative importance of someone's job, you should look for the head count underneath of them, or maybe the profitability of the uh, sector of the business that they're in. So when you're doing business in the US, you need to be aware of this, and you need to make sure that you're talking to the person you want to be talking to, because the job titles can be very confusing and complicated. In terms of meetings, um, Americans tend to use informal presentations in meetings, and this is a way for them to um, show that you're knowledgeable and um, show that you can add value. Um, and meetings are increasing. Americans are increasingly embracing technology, and meetings are becoming more and more uh, virtual. Uh, the Americans take a scientific approach to business, which means that they measure everything. They're constantly trying to be more efficient, and they're trying to improve things. So they measure everything, and this has made a culture of change in the US, where change has become a constant factor. And because of this change being a constant factor, their outlook is very short term. So they're always looking for quick wins. How can they get the most value as soon as they can? So if you're making a pitch to someone in the US, you need to really emphasize how you can give them value and how you can do it fast. Um, in terms of things that you can do in the US, you can use humor in business. Uh, that's a big part of business. But you want to make sure you don't do it at inappropriate times, at tense times. Uh, you can also use enthusiasm because uh, if you don't have enthusiasm in the US, you're just not going to survive in business. Um, things you can't do is bear gifts because a lot of companies have policies against this. You also shouldn't self-deprecate because this is seen as a weakness in the US. Here I have uh, Made in America, and this is because Americans tend to take the view that America, the American way is the best way. So when you're doing business in America, you need to realize this, and you need to really emphasize how you can add value to them, and you really need to argue your points. Moving on now to uh, some of the physical forces in the US. Here I have a map of the US. 
You can see on the west coast, um, some of the natural disasters that they face are tsunamis, volcanoes, earthquakes, mudslides. They also have forest fires, <coughs> excuse me, forest fires and flooding. Uh, in Alaska, they have permafrost, which is not very conducive to development. Um, in the Midwest and the Southeast, they have tornadoes and hurricanes in the Gulf Coast and up the Atlantic Coast. And basically, when you look at this map, you might think that there's no safe place in America. And natural disasters are actually really disruptive to business. And even if you, your business isn't operating exactly in one of these areas, they can still really affect your distribution. Um, in terms of topography, um, there's a <coughs> large chain of mountains on the west coast and some smaller mountains on the east coast. Um, Florida and Hawaii are tropical and the rest of the country is um, mostly temperate. In terms of infrastructure, there are 331.6 million wireless subscribers in the US, 3.9 million miles of public roads, 120,000 miles of railroads, 5,000 public airports, and 25,000 miles of commercially, commercially navigable, excuse me, navigable waterways. So what this means is that the US has a lot of infrastructure, and this is great for distribution. In terms of imports and exports, uh, the U.S.'s major exports are machines, uh, electronic equipment, oil, vehicles, and aircraft. Their major imports are oil, machines, electronic equipment, vehicles, and mechanical and technical equipment. And the major trading partners in terms of importing are China, Canada, Mexico, Japan, and Germany. And in terms of expo exporting, uh, it's Canada, Mexico, China, and Japan. Now I'm going to turn it over to Jordan, who's going to talk about political issues. Thanks, Chris. All right, to start with the political issues, we're going to explain the structure of the government. So the United States is a federal constitutional republic of 50 states, and the duty, or the, sorry, the power is divided between the federal government as well as the state. This is very similar to how Canada has different power for provincial governments and federal governments, and as well, the United States is a democracy like Canada, so voters choose the representatives. The three branches of the government are the legislative branch, which includes Congress, the executive branch, which includes the president and vice president, and the judicial branch, which is the Supreme Court. Now, looking at the political parties, the, all the US parties are seen as more conservative than Canadian parties, especially the Republican Party. C Canada is a much more liberal society. So uh, the current party in power are the Democrats, led by Barack Obama. He is currently in his second term, and it, he will be in power until January 20th, 19, or, sorry, 2017. So after this, he will not be able to run because it's his second four-year term, and his vice president is Joe Biden. So for businesses, one thing that you want to keep in mind is since the power is divided by the state and the federal government, you have to make sure the state that you're going to facilitates your business strategy. So moving on to legal issues, contract law can be verbal or written, and the basis of law for this is the U.S. Constitution. Usually you want to have your contract written out if it's a significant business contract, because verbal contracts aren't upheld as strongly. You need three major requirements for enforceability, which are parties capable of contracting, you need consent, and you need consideration. So this is very similar to Canada. Contracts are upheld by the court and enforced regularly, and there shouldn't be any problems enforcing this for your business. All right, now looking at the cor Corruption Perception Index. So as you can see, these are ranks on the scale, and US is ranked 19, where Canada is nine, and Finland is one. So the US is relatively uncorrupt compared to other countries. There's a total of 174 countries rated on this scale. This, uh, sorry, the situation will be similar to in Canada, and maybe even closer than this may represent because the US is technically, or usually perceived in a little bit of a negative light compared to Canada. Moving on to human rights, Canada and US are very similar in human rights, except two major differences. Capital punishment is a big issue in the US. People believe you should not have the right to decide whether people live or die in the jail system and the healthcare system. Many human rights activists say that everyone should have universal healthcare and the US, although on their way to becoming more like this, they are not facilitating it completely. Okay, 
Next, we're going to talk about trade and trade barriers. So the U.S. is in 14 free trade agreements with 20 countries, compared to Canada, who is in nine free trade agreements. Uh, the most important free trade agreement for them is NAFTA, which generates $919 billion in trade for the U.S. and $570 billion in trade for Canada, and a significant amount of inward FDI, ranging around $230 billion for both countries. A couple of the trading partners in the FTAs are listed on the slide, such as Australia, Canada, and Mexico. And now, more recent news, trade agreement talks. There are 18 FTAs currently being negotiated. The two most important ones I want to talk about is the European Union FTA, which would connect U.S. with four of ten of the largest economies in the world. This has been talked about by Obama and Cameron as a topic for the next G8 summit. And the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would connect the U.S. with a bunch of Asian Pacific er, countries, 11 of them in total. And it's a large export market for the U.S., as you can see. So implications for this is that the U.S. is already a great spot for trade, and their tariff and non-tariff barriers can be even further lowered by these agreements. So looking at the actual numbers for tariffs, you can see that the U.S. overall has lower tariffs than Canada with 2.1% versus Canada at 3.1%. And this is mainly due to the agricultural tariffs that Canada has. If you're a non-agricultural firm, the tariffs are about equal for both countries, and a couple non-tariff barriers are listed on the bottom. So one is the low use of international standards. This is not a problem in Canada as we are more conforming to the international standards, but could be trouble for a company investing in the U.S. Another one that is similar to Canada is the high health and safety standards and environmental protection. This can make it very expensive for companies to involve themselves in our countries. And uh, specific industries that have been noted for the European Union for having trade barriers are the pharmaceutical industry, the American automobile industry, and the wine and spirits industry, which are two of them. The pharmaceutical and wine and spirit industry are also heavily regulated in Canada and can cause non-tariff trade barriers. So as you can see, the Canadian and U.S. environments are pretty similar. The U.S. maybe has a bit of an advantage on Canada in tariffs. Okay, foreign direct investment. This is a very big positive for the United States. They are leading the world in foreign direct investment with $497.5 billion. This represents 21% of U.S. exports and is far ahead of the second place leader, which is Japan, who only has about $260 billion in uh, FDI. Canada is close with around $200 billion of FDI and rated on the OECD Investment Index. Can er, United States is ranked 22 versus Canada, who is ranked 13. On this index, a higher rank is actually better, so this means that U.S. is a more desirable place for foreign direct investment. Also, when looking at the incentives provided by the government, there's 2,657 er, 2, investments at an average value of $19 million provided by the U.S. government, whereas Canada only has 221 incentives at an average value of $4.4 million. So when looking at the data for foreign direct investment, the U.S. is a much more desirable place to invest, and it will continue to lead most countries in the future. All right, for our entry method, we chose a strategic alliance. So there's a couple reasons we did this. The first one is that firms are very compatible due to similarities in the business culture. Also, the U.S. has a wide range of companies, so there is a chance that there's a very complementary company to your, to your business, which is a key factor in choosing a strategic alliance. There's a safe economic environment and large sustained companies, so the companies can be very safe. A lot of the publicly traded companies have many financial statements available and can, you can easily assess the risk of a company. Also, firms in the U.S. will likely want to gain insight to Canadian markets in exchange for help in the U.S. An example of this would be Nestle and General Mills case that is mentioned in the book. And the following two points uh, were huge advantages that they gained such as reduced marketing bu budgets, so the strategies are very transferable, and distribution synergies. But for a more recent example, we chose the Air Canada and United Air Strategic Alliance. So this became official on October 2012, and it allowed the companies to merge revenues and costs. Uh, the companies were able to lower the amount of flights offered to, sorry, They were able to lower the amount of flights offer, offered on routes and the seat sizes while increasing seat prices. So this is obviously an advantage for the companies because it makes them more competitive, as well as lowering costs. 
And also an important factor noted was that the sharing of commercially sensitive data was especially important for this case. And that concludes our presentation. If there's any questions, we feel free to ask them now.